So we just want to encourage you and appreciate you. Just share the gospel with us. Amen. 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 Joe Burns. too and we fell in love and we didn't know anything. We came from dysfunctional families and here we are 40 some years later. She's still my my sweet little Iowa farm girl. And actually the, the we have four daughters and one son and the two older daughters and son who's in the middle. They gave us a lot of headaches, but Teresa was the worst. <laughs> and you know, she uh, she was pretty much at the point where she was losing her mind because of drugs and alcohol, and and she believed her lies. She she would talk delusional almost, and you know, I was at the point after twenty some years where I actually started to pray a couple of times. Lord, you know the future. If she's never ever going to come to you and she's going to continue this lifestyle, please take her now. I was losing hope. And within a couple months of that, we found out about this place down here. We came down here and <coughs> Kathy and I talked Walt into taking her. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know what else to do with her. And uh, here we are. And she has her mind back. Yeah, she's, got a, she's got a clear hand. And all through the years, I've, I wanted to be a, a, a man whose heart was completely the Lord's. You know, and, and I wanted to be a man who knew Christ intimately. Who, it's like, if we could, I want to, I want to know Him as much as is possible to know Him this side of eternity. And, um, you know, and, and the Lord put it on my heart to teach and disciple and, and put it on my heart that, you know, every time I teach, most of the time, I don't know if I'm ever going to have that person or these people in front of me again. And so I give it all I got. I preach to produce a verdict. Now, a lot of you guys know what a verdict is, don't you? <laughs> yeah. I preach to produce a verdict because I don't know how much longer I've got. I don't know how much longer you've got. These guys I see in the jail up there... I never see them again. I see, they take me to different pods all the time whenever I go there, and I have 10 to 20 to 30 guys in front of me in a room, and I'm challenging their hearts. And so many of them say they're believers. And so I ask them if they, you know, did you meet Christ in jail, or did you know Christ before you came to jail? And so many of them say they knew Christ before they came to jail. And I'm saying, what are you doing here for? What are, you, what are you here? Why are you here? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're an obedient follower of Jesus Christ, you have no business being here. What about your families? And then you tell them you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and, and they see no difference in what they see in the world or see on TV. or you know. So I try to challenge these guys. Now, some guys have come to Christ in jail. Well, that's a whole, new, that's a whole different story. And all you guys have had... Your ups and downs, and you're here now. And it's maybe not a perfect program, and it's a tough program, but make the best of it. Don't look back. Yeah, we're going into 2019. We're jumping off the cliff into 2019, right? We're all still alive. And there's a lot of people out there that don't know Christ, right? So... 
it's interesting. I never really know for sure what, what I'm supposed to teach when I come down here. I have months and months of stuff prepared. And, uh... Oops. <laughs> so let's... Let's go to Psalm 27. I'm not going to... Let's just go to Psalm 27, see what happens. And I've read this verse down here before, and I've challenged you guys with this verse before. But I'm not embarrassed to do it again. Psalm 27, 4, a Psalm of David. Start with verse 4. He says, One thing I have asked from the Lord, that I shall seek. And you know, even before you read the rest of it, it's like, so if David has that attitude, Lord, I want whatever he's going to, Go after, I want that too. I probably need that too. As we read God's Word, try to make it practical. You talk to Him about it. Say, Lord, do that in my heart. That's all part of prayer. He says, one thing I have asked from the Lord. It sounds like determination. He says, that I shall seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord most of the days of my life. No, all the days of my life. I mean, we don't know how many days we have left, do we? And I want every single day of my life to have some eternal value. How about you guys and gals? Something of eternal value every single day. Now, let's go back to this. One thing I have asked from the Lord, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Why? To behold the beauty of the Lord, or the delightfulness of the Lord to meditate in his temple. And it's not Eastern meditation, is it? It's inquire, talk to him, ask questions, pour out our heart. Psalm 62, 8 says, you know, talks about pouring out our heart to the Lord. And it's a, in the Hebrew, the word is almost, you throw yourself on the ground before the Lord, and you, Lord, Lord, I want all that you have. I want to be a man whose heart is completely yours, a woman whose heart is completely yours. Don't we all want that? Yeah. Amen. But are we all going to see to it that it comes about? You know, a lot of people, different theologies out there, and uh, all these things, I'm this and I'm that. Well, we're only this and we're only that as we allow God to do the work in us. It's not an automatic, and it's not, well, the, you know, I'm a work in progress, and it's all up to the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit wants to take you deep, deep, and far, and, and close to Jesus Christ, but He won't do it if you don't cooperate and avail yourself and, and pay the price. So, all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, the delightfulness, and to inquire and meditate in His temple and ask Him questions. For in the day of trouble He will conceal me in His tabernacle. In the secret place of His tent He will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock, and now my head will be lifted above my enemies around me. And our primary enemy is probably self, right? <coughs> but we're to die to self daily. Lord, what does that mean? Lord, can that be practical in my life? You know, you read that. You say, Lord, I don't know that I know how to do it. I've never been able to be successful with discipline and, and, and putting others first and letting go of myself. Lord, that this would be the year that I really, in a practical way, die to self. Amen. And then I will offer in his tent sacrifices and shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, that as far as I know, any sin that you've showed me, I've dealt with. Lord, thank you, Father, thank you. I mean, he knows our heart, doesn't he? I mean... Sure, we have positional sanctification in Christ, but God is not fool. 
He knows if we're entangled in sin. He knows if we're dancing around with sin. If we're, he knows our thoughts and our hearts. Oh, Lord, that I would have a Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Uh, it says, the Lord created all this around us. And the earth is his footstool. And what can we do for him? It's a little rough, Lord. But then he says, but. That big word, but. To him I will look. And this word look in the Hebrew means to look. Not just like I'm looking at you guys or I'm looking over the drum set. It's a word that means to look with pleasure, favor, and care. But to this one I will look with pleasure, favor, and care. Almighty God, God the Son, Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit who created the universe, created me. You know, what can I do for Him? I can be a blessing to His heart. I can be a delight to Him if I, number one, am a man who is humble, willing to be, willing to be known for who I really am. Oh, I mean, God sees my heart anyhow. And, and, and Lord, I want to be honest with you and honest with people around me. He, a humble man, a humble woman blesses God's heart. Lord, I need to be a humble man. Number two, to this one I will look with pleasure and favor and care. To him, to her who is contrite of spirit. What does that mean? Contrite of spirit. Could that have something to do with one of the Holy Spirit's primary jobs in our life to convict, to show us sin, to 1 John 1, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, as we walk in the light, the light of God's Holy Spirit showing us His heart, His goodness, showing us the things that are hurtful in our hearts. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Show me if there be any hurtful way in me. Search my heart. I want to see everything that's in my heart, Lord Jesus. I want it all out. I want to walk around with no known sin in my heart today. <coughs> Every day. Don't you? Yes. Yes. But we, we hold on to these sins. And lots of times through the years, you know, I would get tangled up in this sin or that sin. Or my, you know, I got set free from drugs when I was 23 years old. I just walked away from them somehow, miraculously. Everybody thought I was crazy. And end up in a psych ward in a hospital anyhow because they all thought I was crazy, even my dear wife. <laughs> and they wanted to put me on drugs in there. And I said, I just quit drugs. And the priest that married us thought I was abusing her because I said, I quit drugs and I got born again. I didn't know how to explain it because I didn't have a Bible or a church still. And he said, I think you're abusing your wife. And, you know, some marriages aren't meant to last. But, you know, everybody thought I was crazy, but I knew I wasn't. And, uh, I forgot my point. Contrite art. Yes, yes. And walking in the light. And, uh... I do want every day to hate my sin because of my deeper, deeper love for Jesus Christ. And how's the only way to grow deeper in love with Jesus Christ? Watching TV? You know, the TV is like having an open open sewage drain in your living room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and sadly, a lot of what we see on Christian TV or Christian radio and all that, there's so much falseness, so much deception, so much 80% truth and 20% heresy. If you don't spend time alone with Jesus Christ and His Word every day, you're probably going to be a disaster. You're going to be as... As, as mixed up as most of the church is, unfortunately. What I try to tell anybody who will listen, and, and the nice thing is they'll let me come down here and teach, and the church I come from, they won't anymore. But 
if if we want to. <laughs> Kathy told me not to take my glasses on and off and take drinks of water, so <laughs> I'll try not to. Anyhow. Um, The number one. Glasses. I don't need my glasses. <laughs> I think that. Okay, no, remember this. If you remember anything from me, if each one of us will spend 20 minutes a day with Jesus Christ alone in His Word, of course, asking the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and asking the Holy Spirit to lead us into the depths of the truth of His Word we will be able to transform the world we live in. The Lord will be able to use us. He'll be able to entrust people into our lives because I think the number one problem isn't the devil. The number one problem in churches today, and right now you guys are in a safe environment, and you've got brothers and sisters in the Lord to walk shoulder to shoulder with you and watch your back and challenge you and call you out. And it may be tough, but when you get out of here in 2019, this last year you have left maybe, or maybe you have a bunch of years left, you're going to face a lot of churches, a lot of apostasy, a lot of dryness, a lot of churches that the people say they want to see people born again, but they're not willing to pay the price. Um, you know, you're going to see a lot of people in these churches that are entangled in sin, and that enslaves us, even as believers, right? Can believers become entangled and enslaved in sin? We're going to see a lot of people that have drifted, that have hardened hearts, Hebrews 3, who, um, they're in, they can't get out, they're good, maybe they're not doing all God wants them to do, and they might not get as many rewards, but gee whiz, it's the Holy Spirit's job to <laughs> cause them to go deep anyhow, full of excuses. So I think the number one problem in churches today is they're entangled in sin. So when you guys get out there, you may face an environment where if you're on fire and alive for the Lord and you want to see holiness, you want to see hearts completely His, you want to see people saved, and you want to see people discipled, you might be in irritation. And you may have to end up walking alone for a period of time, or whatever the cost, whatever it takes, right? So the number one problem I see is that the church is entangled in sins, which kind of leads to the number two problem. If they're entangled in sin, and they're full of the world, and full of the wisdom of the world, they probably don't really know Jesus Christ that well. And they don't love Him that well. They, in their heads they love Him. In their heads they, they know Him. But the only way to really know someone is to spend time with Him. In His Word and prayer. So that, and then, so, entangled in sin. Don't really know Jesus Christ that well. Because if, if we spend time with Jesus Christ in His Word every day, talking to Him, pouring out our heart before Him, and saying, Lord, do that in me. And Lord... I'm an ambassador. I'm an ambassador with a message of reconciliation. Lord, that I would understand the gospel just as you understand it. Lord, that I would see the lost as you see them. That I would be brokenhearted for the lost as you are. And that I would be able to handle your word accurately. 2 Timothy 2.15 Lord, I don't know much about your word now. I can paraphrase some stuff and I've heard all this stuff through the years, but... I want to be in it with you and really see your depths, the unfathomable riches in Jesus Christ found through His Word and spending time with Him. If you spend 20 minutes a day, and I challenge you to do that because I know it'll turn into 30 and 40 and an hour, and you'll become men and women of God who, who God can then bring and trust people into your lives. Because if we're a sin-sick church entangled in sin, and 
as much like the world as the world is, and if we don't know His Word, we don't know His heart, is God going to bring convicted souls into our lives? Is He going to entrust people into our lives? I mean, probably not. Probably not. And if one, and, and is He going to bring people into our lives that the Holy Spirit, because it's the Holy Spirit that convicts hearts, right? Concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And by the way, how many of us are praying ahead every day, Holy Spirit, bring me to people that you're working with. Bring me to people, hearts that you're convicting. And Lord, I'm, I'm equipped. I know your word well enough. I need to know it better, but I know it well enough that I can share your heart because I know you. I've spent time with you. I can share the gospel. And then when people, he brings people into our lives, we share his heart. They get saved, they get set free, they get redeemed. They, they have new life in Christ. They're no longer slaves of sin. They're no longer slaves of their father, the devil. They're no, under, no longer under the wrath of God. You know, mercy is still available now, right? And he's not going to, you know, you, he brings those people into your life and you share the gospel and you share your heart. You're probably going to be stuck with them, aren't you? Hallelujah, what a privilege. That God would, would bring somebody who's come to Christ to you, but then what are you going to teach him? You're going to teach him charismania, you're going to teach him the Reformed, uh, you know, Baptistic, you're the Wesleyan Nazarene, or, or you're going to say, well, go to this church or listen to that guy on the radio or watch this guy on TV. You're going to have to show him firsthand. Amen. God's Word and Jesus' heart. And you're going to have to introduce Him to Jesus Christ through His Word and say, here's how you grow. And the Holy Spirit will keep you right in the balance beam of truth. Because, you know, Jesus is not a Pentecostal, a Nazarene, and a Wesleyan, and a Calvinist. and He's not all those things. He's not schizophrenic. He, the Word of God means one thing. It means one thing. And we have a responsibility to know what that means because as we know Him, we know His heart. He'll bring people into our lives. We'll be able to disciple them. And they'll be able to go out and share the gospel with others. So, stay away from sin, you guys. Get you out of here by 10 or 11 tonight. So, as we spend time with Christ alone in His Word, worshiping Him, getting to know Him, beginning to learn how to worship Him, beginning to know how to be thankful to Him, pouring out our hearts to Him, inquiring of Him, digging into His Word, asking Him to do the things in His Word in our hearts and our lives. Our, our thinking is going to be transformed. Do a lot of us have problems with thinking, the way we think, the things that we've learned, the things that the world has kicked into us, beat us around with. We can have the mind of Christ as we get to know Him and spend time with Him in His Word. Lord Jesus, I want to have Your mind. Lord Jesus, I want to see the people around me as You see them. Please bring divine appointments into my life. And when somebody brings, when God brings somebody into your life and you're scared to death, you're not sure what to say, you just real quickly just say, Lord, that I would see them the way You see them that you would give me words to say that I would have your heart for this person. And that's going to be some of the benefits of spending time with Jesus Christ alone in His Word. You'll be prepared for those divine appointments. I mean, that's what it's all about. We're ambassadors for Christ to share the gospel. He wants to use us. He wants to use our prepared hearts. He wants to use us who can handle His Word accurately. That's one of the biggest problems. Nobody hardly knows God's Word anymore. They can paraphrase a few things, but they can't find anything in the Bible. And if you're at the point where you're getting things straightened away, 
you're, you're, you're walking away from those sins that have entangled you for years and years and years. You've maybe destroyed your family life. You've destroyed everything. Well, no one expects you to know the Word of God deeply and inside and out. But here's a place to start. Day by day, what you're learning here, you go home to your room and you dig into it. You say, Lord, do that in me. Make that come alive in me. So I don't want to put any guilt on anybody. If you have been nothing but a train wreck like Teresa, and you're starting fresh now, you're in the perfect place. You're right where God wants you. You can have every sin that you know cleared up and dealt with. You can be a joy and a, a, a delight to Almighty God right where you are. Okay, just push ahead. You know, but as you spend time with Christ, you're going to become more and more discerning. You're going to see things around you. There's a, a fog of delusion and lies and propaganda everywhere you go. And, you know, it may be in the next year or two that, I mean, the Bible is going to be declared hate speech. Who knows? And uh, we'll be thrown in jail. We'll lose our lives for really following Christ. That may happen. So, be diligent with the time you have. Amen. You know, as we spend more time with Jesus Christ, it deepens our love for Him and grows our hate for our own sin. That's a good way to finally break free from the sin that's been dragging you down for years and years and years. We become more like Christ. We become more trustworthy. We become more contrite of heart more quick to respond to the Holy Spirit's working in our life. We have a reverence for, the fa for our Father, for His Word. It's easier to die to self and to really truly be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Acts 15, 7, 8, and 9, I think, is the true evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe in all the gifts, but the true evidence to me of being filled with the Holy Spirit By the way, I'm neither a Pentecostal or a Baptist or an Arminian. It seems to me like the Word of God is kind of in the middle of all three of those. And I want to go where the Word of God goes. But Acts 15, and uh, Peter's at the council in Jerusalem. And you know, God's been working through the Gentiles through Peter. And you know, these guys aren't too sure about all that. Verse 7, after there was much debate and questioning, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, because I'll try to deceive myself, Lord. I'll try to rationalize. I don't know about you guys. But God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as He also did to us, and He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. The word cleansing, to make clean, free from all admixture, purifying, purging. The cleansing work of the Holy Spirit. You know, before the day of Pentecost, they were in the upper room, they were all praying. You know, and, and I'm sure God was showing them their hearts and they were dealing with things. And they were ready. They had hearts that were emptied of sin and God could fill them with the Holy Spirit and all the signs and wonders. But the real evidence to me is a cleansed heart by the fire of the Holy Ghost that that's a person who's filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what I want. I want all the gifts that God wants to give me through the Holy Spirit. But if my heart is completely His and my sin account, at least for that day, is non-existent, and I've spent time with him, and I am brokenhearted about the lost as he is, that's wonderful, that's where I want to be. So, let's, let me ask you something. Is prayerlessness a sin? The only biblical evidence I found out about it is 
in 1 Samuel 12, 23, where, you know, the, the people wanted a king. Samuel had been a great judge, good guy, and, and he said, you know, uh, I'm not going to sin against God by not praying for you. And I was trying to find other verses that actually said that, you know, lack of prayer is a sin. But clearly, it's stupid. <laughs> Jesus, didn't Jesus pray all night in Luke 6, 12? He prayed all night. God the Son prayed all night. And, you know, it's hard for me to pray for 10 or 15 minutes, right? And uh, one nice thing, sometimes when I go to the jail, I guess we better start pretty soon, huh? Um, they make me wait in this cold entry room before the, 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 uh, uh, the guys come up to get me. And they're usually irritated because they're busy and they, you know. But, uh, you know, the last time I was there, I waited for an hour. But it was good because I kept saying, Lord, what should I pray for now? You know, Lord, what should I pray for now? And uh, so it was really a good prayer time. And one night they didn't even come and get me, and I just prayed the whole time. It's like, this must, I still told Kathy, this must be what the Lord wanted me to do, is just pray. Because I kept saying, Lord, who should I pray for now? And he brought somebody else to mind. But, uh, so prayerlessness. Jesus prayed all night. Jesus wept and brokenness for Jerusalem. He wanted their hearts, but they wouldn't have it. Um, Paul, in Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1, he records a prayer for the, for, for the people that he had reached out to and taught and poured his heart into. So, um, a fellow by Leonard Ravenhill. Anybody heard of Leonard Ravenhill? Or uh, A.W. Tozer? I don't like to follow too many guys, but I like those guys. They're both dead and gone, but uh, Ravenhill said, no man or woman is greater than his prayer life. Yeah. And uh, Tozer, he said, let me live with the man a while and share his prayer life, and I'll tell you how tall or big he is spiritually. I'll tell you how majestic I think he is in God. Hmm. If our prayer lives were exposed to the public, I don't know, we might be pretty embarrassed. If our hearts were exposed to the public, we might be pretty embarrassed sometimes. Like if the Holy Spirit came in here and, and had a Polaroid picture of each one of our hearts, or a detailed computer printout of each one of our hearts, what's in our hearts, would we be willing to pass them around to everybody? So, but let's get rid of those secret sins because they're going to burn us. They're going to put us on the shelf. They're going to cause God to have to bypass us because God is not going to be using people that are entangled in sin. So let's not be entangled in sin. It's simple. Spend time with Christ every day in His Word. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you what's in your heart. Ask God to show you anything hurtful in there and clear it up. And then say, Lord, I want to I want to have your heart for things and for people. And he'll take you up on it. Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Yeah. Hebrews 2 and 4, he's there to intercede for us and to step in for us. And, you know, he wants us to be effective in sharing his heart and discipling. So, just read you one more thing here. A guy by, a guy by the fellow uh, by the name of Guy King, he wrote, "No one is a firmer believer in the power of prayer than the devil. Not that he practices it, but he suffers from it." So. Hey, God's Word is going to be with us forever. The sum of His Word is truth. Every one of His righteous ordinances is everlasting. And in David, in, in, uh, in Psalm 119, verse 162, says, My heart rejoices in His Word. And it's a word that means almost that He jumps for joy. God, that our hearts would jump for joy because we love Your Word so much and we love spending time with You and Your Word. And, and I love you so much more now, Lord Jesus. And thank you for bringing that person into my life. 
let's be effective. Let's be effective saints. Hearts completely hives. Our lives aren't our own, right? Romans 14, 7 and 8. Be determined to deeply know Him. Psalm 27, like David, to spend time with Him every day. That we be broken hearted. That we be just broken hearted for those that Jesus Christ shed His blood for. For those who are still dead in their sins. You know, who prayed for me? Who prayed for you guys? Why did I come to Christ? Why? Me. Pray that you can accurately handle His Word and accurately and effectively disciple new believers. So let me close with Philippians chapter 3. And thanks for putting up with me, you guys. I appreciate you all. And we hope to see... Church on the Street, Kingman. Yeah, I'm kind of scared about it, but I'll do my part. My life's not my own. He's got to bring the right people. Some of you, maybe Mickey, Michael. Michael, are you in here? Big Mike. Which Michael? He's over there. Philippians yeah. 3. Philippians 3, verse 7. You all know this, but Lord, make this verse come alive in our hearts. But whatever things were gained to me, were profit, advantage to me, these things I have counted loss for the sake of Christ. Oh, yes, Lord. More than that, much more than that in the Greek, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value, the surpassing value of knowing Christ. And this is deeply knowing Him, intimately knowing Him, um, from spending time with Him. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ. Paul wanted all that he had. Lord Jesus, I want all that you have. I may not know what I'm asking, but that's what I want, Lord Jesus. I trust you. I love you. I believe you, Lord. And that I may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own, no. But that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him, intimately know Him, and the power of His resurrection, truly be filled with His Holy Spirit, and the fellowship of His sufferings, whoa. Lord, whatever you have in mind for me, Lord, that's fine, because... I want to bring glory to you. I want to be a blessing to you. I want to be, con you know, the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Lord, I don't know, but if, if, if any of us have to die for you, I just trust that you'll bring us through it and that we would die well for you, Lord Jesus, if that's what it takes, if that's what it comes to in the next few years. In order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead, not that I've already attained it, this, this Christ-like perfection. Or I've already become perfect, a state of completion. Yes, we are works in progress, but let's not use it as an excuse for, to drag our feet into holiness. But I press on, I keep up the chase in order that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ. And I think we're laid hold of by Christ to be like Him and to effectively do His work. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of, seized upon, catch, caught, and hold down that for which I was laid hold of by Christ. I do, whoops, verse 13. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. You guys, let's all forget what lies behind. We all have a lot to forget. I have a lot to forget. A lot of wasted time, but I'm still alive. You're still alive. Forgetting what lies behind. There we are. And reaching forward, stretching forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal and prize of the upward call of Christ, of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us therefore, as many of us as are perfect, mature, have this attitude. And if anyone have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you also. 
in your one-on-one -on -one time with Him, right? However, let us keep living by the same standard to which we obtained. Brethren, boy, let's hope we can all say this to other people. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Lord, I want people to be able to look at me and walk in my pattern, walk in my, you know, following my example. Lord, that we would all be godly men and women who the lost could look at us and see you, Lord Jesus. For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Oh, Lord, I'd be broken hearted about that. Whose end is destruction. And of course, we used to be there. Whose God is their appetite. Whose glory is in their shame. Who set their minds on earthly things. Lord, that my mind would be set on heavenly things. Because verse 20, our citizenship. Right now, I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm an ambassador here on earth. And I eagerly wait for you to come back, Lord Jesus, though I really do hope it's not too soon because I've wasted so much time. I want to do all that He can do through me and through us. And then when He comes, He'll transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. Amen. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. So, I'm not on resolutions, but if we can all resolve to spend 20 minutes a day with Christ and His Word, and all resolve to make sure that our sin account, day by day, is totally non-existent, and that we are ready, willing, and able for Him to bring people into our lives that we can share His heart with and then begin to disciple them. I hope the best for all of you guys. And um, thanks for putting up with Chuck Burns. say one more thing? If any of you still in this room are, are not sure that you're, you've been set free or you're not sure if you're still dead in your sins, you're not sure if, if you ever really trusted Christ, you're not sure that the Holy Spirit has ever convicted you of your sin and you've turned from your ways and turned to Christ in faith, get it squared away. Yeah. Don't go off into eternity wondering or thinking or Hardened of heart. And there's a lot of guys here and gals here who can share the gospel more fully, more completely. They can show you things in God's Word. But if any of us here don't really know Christ, you can resolve that. So, I don't really... I'm going to pray a prayer that you can follow along with if you like. But you need to settle this with you and the Lord. And if the Holy Spirit's convicting your heart and showing you that you're a sinner and that you have never turned, repented, turned from your way and turned to faith in Christ, believing upon the Lord Jesus, you can talk to Him about it, pray this prayer, prayer something like this. That Lord, well, no, just listen. Lord, I just... Thank you for convicting my heart. Thank you for showing me that I'm a sinner and that I'm on my own carrying my sins and I'm under your wrath, Lord, and I, and I just no longer want to be there. I believe upon you, Lord Jesus. I believe that you died in my place. I believe that you died for my sins. You shed your blood for me and your word says if I turn from my ways and turn to you in faith and believe upon you, that I will be saved, I will be born again, I will be set free, I'll be ransomed, my sins will be forgiven, be washed clean, and I'll be your child, I'll be part of your family, my name will be written in your book of life, Lord, and I just want to be yours, I want to follow you in obedience, and I want my life to be forever changed, that I would know you deeply, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for saving me, amen. Amen.
Bruce Chapman. You know, the whole bottom line, we've been, just we've been hearing just recently, God came to give us life. How many want life? How many is willing to accept the plan of God? I was doing this down at St. Mr. Paul a couple of times. I got a dollar. So, okay, anybody wants Jesus, come on up here and get on the altar. Wait a minute, first, first. <laughs> if I say, I want to give you a gift, and I walked up, will you take that gift? God offers us a gift. Will you take it? What that means, yielding to him. Yeah. Totally, completely sold out. You see what we've been here preaching about lately? His excitement what happens when you let God be God. He's got a gift greater than we can ever think or imagine. But we accept it. And that's just letting him... If, in fact, once you get the gift, it, it, it gets better and better. It stirs you up. It revives you. It opens your understanding like you've never been able to see before because it's God working in you doing His will and His good pleasure. But you got to accept the gift. And I'm going to tell you, this is the dumbest thing, but it's so simple. How do you know if you're hungry or not? God puts a desire in your heart. If you didn't eat, you'd die. God puts a desire in our heart to serve Him. If we'll accept it, we're going to die. Think about how simple that is. He puts that desire in our heart. And by the way, I don't know how you eat. If you eat nutritiously, then you're going to flourish. But if you pig out on the wrong kind of stuff, you're going to... Boom. It's the same thing. Think about it. You know, all we need to do is just let God be God. The simplicity. Simplicity of simply letting God be God. He'll stir. He knows how to do it all. Just put Him first. Just seek Him. Let Him be God. And He'll show you what to do. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. He knows what we need more than we do. And I'll tell you something. You let Him be God. You cannot, cannot, cannot fall short. Cannot make a mistake. And I'm going to tell you what. You get so fired up, it's real. And that's what's happening to the people that know their God. People that know their God are going to be strong. No, we heard tremendous, tremendous tonight about a man just crying out, trying to say, yes, I want God, I want God, I want God, with everything I got. How many want that? Yes. All right, come on up the altar. <coughs> if you don't want it, just sit there. You've got to put the desire in your heart, just like having lunch. Just stand up here. Joe, you can have a spray for us. So don't pray. Come on, come on. Everybody, this, if you don't want him, fine. If you want him, fine. He knows your heart. He's put the desire in there. Now, are you going to pig out on him, or are you going to just nibble, or are you going to just ignore it? I don't want to eat that. I don't want to do this. Come on. So, Father, I just thank you for letting me be here tonight with all these wonderful people that you've redeemed and maybe a few that are becoming redeemed have just become redeemed or are going to truly understand and come to you completely with all their hearts Lord that we would be strong we would be mighty men and women of God in this battle and that as we as these, all these wonderful folks head out of here in the next few months or years that you would send them out into all different parts of the world and, and that they would be strong and they'd be willing to walk alone if they have to and that they would be, that people would look upon them and see you, Lord Jesus, and that they would be full of your Holy Spirit and power and have hearts that are completely yours. And I just thank you for that, Lord Jesus, that you love us, you're gracious, you're merciful. And Lord, that we would 
have your heart and your mind. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Oh, what I wanted to tell you, if I could, for just a second, well, I've told you all to spend 20 minutes a day with Jesus Christ and His Word. A lot of you, maybe, if you want a kind of a guideline, I've brought this up here before, but I've kind of added some things to it, but I've got a bunch of copies of these at a typical quiet time in the life of, and you put your own name in there, but it gives you kind of a guideline on how you might put this time together with the Lord. And uh, I got a bunch of these. If anybody wants one, just come and get one. And if uh, you don't get one, Louine, she'll have a, an original. She can make copies. So just grab it. And uh, thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time together. Father, that we'd bring great joy to your heart, that we'd be a blessing to you, that we would uh, just love you with everything that we've got, and that we would um, just, Lord Jesus, that we would be obedient. We just thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.